I'm taking it. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my head podcast, Mitch Julian. Today I'm joined by Mitch. Mitch, welcome to the show. Thank you. Welcome. Thank, hey. thank you, Keith. Welcome to Mr. the show. There you go. And you. Richard, welcome to the show. Great to be here, Julian. Oh, yes. man, it's great to have every single one of you guys. Ladies and gentlemen, Angry Beavers reunion, man. We're doing it with the, uh, what was, what's the trio? I know the dynamic do. I don't know if there's one for a, a, a trio. But nonetheless, man, Mitch, you were getting ready to tell us a pilot story. I would love to hear how Angry Beavers came to be. Well, <laughs> I was working for a company called Gunther Wall, named Gunther Wall. And uh, Mr. Gunther's son was working there at the time. And he had an opening to Nickelodeon. So uh, Lee Gunther came to me and said, Mitch, we need three concepts to pitch Nickelodeon because we have a window. And the Angry Beavers was one of them. The other one was a talking house. I can't remember the third one. So uh, it got pitched and they liked it. And so we did this pilot. And, um, so Richard came on as uh, Daggett early on. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was one of the first people we hired voice wise. But I think uh, after we did the pilot, I can't remember who played Norbert. I really can't. But when we got the show pickup, like almost a year and a half later, Richard came back in and sat through something like 300 auditions, auditions. for Norbert. And he was he was willing to do that and very cooperative and very helpful. So uh, when we got the Nick Bukai, which I think was your suggestion, right, Keith? Bring him in. Yeah, I had just worked on a sketch comedy show with him the year before for Carsey Warner. And uh, yeah, and I said, let's try him because, I mean, he's not just a good performer, but also a good writer. He's got a, I think he currently has a sitcom on now, right? A, a bookie? That just yes, yes, yeah, that's on HBO. Um, I think on it's HBO. on HBO, yeah. That's the, um, yeah, he's worked yeah. with Chuck Lorre a lot in recent mm -hmm. years. And uh, no, I just knew Nick and said, why don't we give him a shot? And uh, you know, the rest is history, as they say. It's, you know, because I think also uh, you recommended that I check out Nick Bakai on the Alan Havy show. He was kind of Alan Havy's Ed McMahon. Mm. Time. Yeah. Back when Park uh, Comedy Central was named something else. Um, yeah. So it we was checked ha. It, out. it was ha, right? It was ha. Yeah. Yeah, because there was the Comedy Channel and and Ha, and they merged for yeah. you know, shortly thereafter, somewhere in the early nineties. Yeah, right. I remember uh, getting the audition um, for for the Angry Beavers, and my take on Daggett was Lou Costello from uh, from Abbott and Costello. I'm a huge <clears throat> Abbott and Costello Marx Brothers fan. I'm just like I love old comedy. I love um, you know all. Uh, uh, Laurel and Hardy. And so my original tag, it was Norbert, we've been kicked out of our dam. Well, mm -hmm. unbeknownst to me, Mitch and I had the same love of the old comedy teams. We both loved Avin and Costello and we loved Laurel and Hardy and, and all of those, but particularly Avin and Costello. And I remember being at Gunther Wall on, on one of the callbacks or something and standing outside and Mitch and I were standing outside talking and I didn't realize at the time that Mitch had created the show. He was just on a cigarette break. Do you remember that, Mitch? You were yeah. standing outside. It was yeah. off of Victory there near where the train yeah. station is now. And I just went, oh, I just love, you know, Abbott and Costello and everything. And to this day, we still we still have this love of like any any of the old comedy teams, huge Marx Brothers fans. And uh, that yes. that that's when I knew that we were simpatico because my, as I said to Mitch and Keith on several occasions, if you think about it, um, Lou Costello is just a cross between Nathan Lane and um, Tyne Daly. You listen to me, Christine. I am a New York cop. And, um, and, and, Alan, and, you know, and, and Nathan Lane was Hakuna Matata, which gives you Daggett. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you also, Richard, as the show went on, you went through oh, phase. Yes, you, went through, I did. I, you went through a Bob Hope phase. You went yes. through a Glenn <laughs> Gary Glenn Boss phase. Yes, I did. And that's what I loved about working with Mitch <laughs> is that he let me do that stuff because I was just in a I was just in a place where where like for a while I was like, hey, isn't that wild? Hey Norbert, isn't that wild? 
<laughs> we would just throw it in wherever we want. And then the, we actually did the end of Glen Gary, Glen Ross on the episode of where we were selling candy, right? Were we selling candy? I think so. Yeah, and at the end, I come in and I go, Norbert, I put my name up on that board. I put my name. And Nor and Nick is going, go to lunch, Daggett, go to lunch. And it was just the end of Glen Gary, Glen Ross. <laughs> And then one of our producers at the time, Mike Gerard, turned to Mitch and said, is he ever going to do Daggett again? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And Mitch said, I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, and I, I was thinking about this today. Uh, you and Nick, we had Nick in a booth, a separate booth, so you guys could overlap dialogue. And um, we'd have the script there. And both Richard and Nick got to know those characters so well and their relationship so well that they would they would go off on tangents but they always knew to come back to where we what the story was and where we were going uh, and so i would just a lot of times just turn them loose you know and go mm -hmm. uh, which the writer always loves right keith <laughs> well i there was a thing, there was a, a dreaded moment in every recording for Mitch where, where I would go, uh, Mitch. <laughs> <laughs> and I would call a little bit of a sidebar because, you know, I, I kind of had, I, I was keeping an eye on the script sort of like, you know, if we go there, <laughs> the rest of this story makes no sense or we can't, this does not follow that. Yeah. So how about we try again, you know? Yes. Yeah. So Keith would off. So Mitch would be at the at the at the control right next to the the mixing board right there directing us. And I would, I would often watch Keith sitting on the couch behind, going, oh, "Mitch, Mitch, um, <laughs> yeah." Show and, this and, and and so if I'm the voice of sanity, yes. um, you you're in trouble, right? So <laughs> we're in big trouble. Well, how many times, Keith, did you say we need to do a story about the beavers going to Uranus? <laughs> yes, yes, that that was my that was the pitch that never got done. <laughs> that was oh, the shows what? we didn't get done. We did a we did a thing a, like a spinoff. We did it like a, a parody of Rent the musical. It was called Rats the musical. Yeah. I loved that episode. It never got animated, but it was it was fun. That was a fun episode. Was that the what was the what was the name of the rock opera episode? Oh, God, I'm trying to remember. Yeah, we were working on the right. We actually were working on that one. We had um, we had um, Roger Daltrey, as a matter of fact, right? Didn't we have Roger Daltrey had, lined up? We also had Jeff Lynn of ELO. He was interested. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The guy, the, uh, the trombone player from uh, Chicago, Lee mm -hmm. Lockney came in because he was going to marry somebody yeah. there at studio. Mm -hmm. And so we put it all together and we were going to record this thing and we showed it to one of the execs and uh, their response our, was our first mistake. Yeah. Well, the <laughs> kid, kids don't know who Chicago is. Magnum Opus was the name of that one. I just Googled it. Hey, good. Very good. good. Very good. Rats, rats was rats. I got the plague. It's in my nose. It's in my legs. My tongue's thickly coated. My eyes, something, something, but I love that episode. I still, have the, I still have the CD of that. Oh, of your, I have to send that to Of me. the music. Yeah, no, it's, it's great. And then, then there was the, um, the Halloween special. Oh, get me. That's such a good one. That's such a, a good yeah. one. That's with Oxnard Ooh. Montalvo, Tom King. Another piece of art. And I was also excited when we were going to do the sequel the following year, a tribute to Hammer Films. And we recorded it. We had Terrence Stamp and Sheena Easton and mm -hmm. the guys, Reese Davies uh, from Indiana yeah, from Jones. Indiana Jones. We had a big cast and we had Michael York as Van Helsing. Yes. It was a big cast. We never animated that one? We got it recorded. And then what well, I think what happened, we were going to do as an episode. There you go. There's it. There's from, that's from Halloween. Get yeah, me. Yeah, that's outside. I'm sorry for the. I don't have a lighting uh, director here. Oh, it's it's fine. But this is. I always thought Dag looked like a wiener. Yeah, no, he's a, I was a opposable, opposable thumb. thumb. Yeah, he's an opposable <laughs> thumb. Yeah. So, and so what happened? Anyway. We got that recorded, and 
So we got that show recorded and we were going to make it uh, the second Halloween special for the following year. Uh, and then somebody at the studio, one of the execs came down and said, you know, would you consider doing an Angry Beavers movie? So I said, yeah, we've got the story for it, which is the the Halloween special with Dracula, Terrence Stamp playing Dracula. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, uh, so, you know, the Nickelodeon movies were being done for something like 25 million at that time each. And uh, so <laughs> could you do it for five? It's like, well, maybe. And then the next time I talked to him, could you do it for three? And I just said no. Mm -hmm. So that's why the, it just got shelved. It was funny because we had a lot of a lot of um, really big stars <clears throat> on the show through the years. And, yeah. and we would never know if they wanted to play or not. Because like in the booth, yeah. Nick and I were improvisers. Like we we could play with anyone. And Mitch would always send me in to kind of test the guest stars to see yeah. if they were going to play or they just wanted to get their job done. Yes. And Michael York in this one, it was a particular one because I walked in and I was very brazen in my in my youth. I walked in, I said, Michael York, Michael York, any relationship to Dick York of bewitched fame? <laughs> and he looked at me without a beat and he goes, no, but I understand that Dick Sargent is a distant cousin. And then Mitch and I knew, oh, he's going to play. Okay. To play. Yeah. Yeah. And I also think that when, <clears throat> when Sheeta Easton walked in, you were standing there by the console and you just picked up a phone yes. and you started like, you, did you send this? Did you send her over here? Yes. Yeah. Who, who is Sheeta Easton? What the yeah. I pretended, you know what? This, this woman's really good. I mean, I think she can sing too. I think she's got a future. Yeah. Um, and then I would say, uh, I would say, Oh, I remember, I remember this. this one of my favorite Sheen Easton stories, you'll probably remember this one, is that um, she would say, you know, my kids, they wake up, you know, in the morning and they don't believe that I, she says, my kids, they don't believe I was ever a pop star. And I said, I'm sure when they wake up in the morning in the mansion, they had some idea <laughs> you did something. Yeah. She says, she says, no, she goes, now I'm doing like airport openings in China. And I said, oh, I love that song. You did My my Baby Takes the Morning Rickshaw, right? <laughs> and she's like, yes, you know it. <laughs> but you know, she was fascinated with you because she'd be in the booth and you could watch her. She was just watching you doing all these voices and all these nuanced things that you were doing. But when I was sitting on the couch with her in the yeah. <laughs> control room, she was wearing a dress, a short dress. And I'm sitting there, just sitting next to her. And she looks over like, I forgot to shave my big toes this morning. you said toes <laughs> but she i mean she was great though i mean she gave as good as she got she was great i yeah. mean she, and you could tell that she had like worked with the boys you know the band oh. and probably the roadies and stuff like that because uh she was not shocked by us at all no no <laughs> not, and, not, and, not, in the, not in the least and then yeah. terrence stamp, uh terrence stamp played dracula and he did it with that dry terrence stamp delivery and it was hysterical the way he yeah. delivered the lines. It was like a disinterested Dracula. And uh, so <laughs> we finished the recording I, and he's leaving. So I, I go outside and his agent comes outside to go to the car. And I said, I, I'm concerned. Deterrence, is he have, did he have a good time? I'm really worried. And Terrence Stamp walks out the door and this guy's like, Terrence, Terrence, come over here. Did you have a good time? I had a wonderful. <laughs> never smiled no he didn't but he had those steely blue eyes yeah. Yeah. was there anybody you guys wanted to work with that you didn't get to work with as far as the voice cast actors actresses go hmm. well that would be a Mitch question Mitch well I'll preface this by saying uh, the joke around the studio was these guys have heard it Oh, Mitch must be recording today because there's a hearse out front. Because uh, <laughs> I love to bring in these B movie actors and things from from the fifties and sixties. You know, Beverly Garland and and uh, uh -huh. right. uh, Ken Toby and Peter Graves and all these people. Uh, yeah. But I, 
it's just, it feels like we got to get everybody we wanted. We I wanted Christopher Lee to play the Dracula part for uh, with that Terrence Stamp did, and I'm glad we had Terrence Stamp. But uh, he just didn't understand his agent didn't understand Christopher Lee's agent that it's it's a cartoon. He kept thinking that he had to go to a location to shoot something, <laughs> and I was always explaining, no, it's a cartoon. You just go into a studio and you record the lines in the front of a microphone. Well, where would he have to go? Uh, <laughs> so <To the> studio, <laughs> and then he wants a lot of money. But that's well, still we really we did we did have a lot of people. Sorry, Keith, we did have a lot of people that were a lot of fun, like Terrence, that we kept bringing back. Like Ed Winter was one of our favorite guys yes. ever. We brought Ed back a lot. Um, your friend from uh, Oklahoma, Mitch. Oh, Gaylord. Yeah, Gaylord. Gaylord. Gaylord was so, we had so many fun, fun people. And um, is it was, Arlie Ermey? Arlie Ermey. Arlie Ermey loved doing the show. He yeah, loved that's, it. That was my, my dream combo is when I wrote the, the Tale of Two Rangers, which again, that was that last season where we recorded some stuff that didn't actually get made, or get animated. But it was him and then Robert Stack. Yes. Played, played the other agent and i have to say amazing thing robert stack was already well into his 80s and yes. he the best cold read of a script ever i mean he just you know I, i'd like to flatter myself and say like well you know i i, I wrote to his voice and, but like no he just comes in and he's he's robert stack you know that you know that from airplane that character like oh, the people who run the airlines are all liars and cheats you know that <laughs> that over the top kind of drama thing and he goes through it and like doesn't miss a beat yeah. and and it, it was like you know you could see how well trained he was and, and all of that and he was just he was game for it and yeah he was. was wonderful and they they played off each other really well Keith did you write the did you write the Libra's Honor Stallion that's what I was just about to ask yeah uh yeah yeah <laughs> Did you? Yes. Yeah, he did. yeah, I wrote that. Oh, how they pranced. Yeah. Oh, I <laughs> know was, who that I was the one, yeah. That was the, you know, that was the, those pitch meetings, especially early on, the pitch meeting to the network were always just kind of, because we would come off with these kind of left field ideas and, and, you know, and they would just look at you like, really? Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And <laughs> this is funny how. And, <laughs> And, but we would just, you know, we'd just go, no, trust us. It'll be really funny. Yeah. Um, and sometimes you know, it was. It, a lot of times it was, you know, one <laughs> of my favorite. Often. 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 Uh, yeah. One of my favorite guest stars ever, and and the boys will both remember this, is Jonathan Harris. Oh. Yes. So Jonathan Harris loved the show. He would sit back and, and Mitch... And I, I mean, Nick and I would be doing our scenes and he would just go, we'd hear him go, brilliant, genius, genius, dear boys, genius. <laughs> and he told one of the funniest stories I've ever heard. And I will tell this story and you'll, you guys remember this. So they were doing the, the new Lost in Space movie and um, they didn't ask him to do to reprise the role of Dr. Smith in any way, shape, or form. So he goes, so have you seen the, the Lost in Space movie they're doing with the delightful Matt LeBlanc? <laughs> Do you know that they asked me to show up at the premiere? And I said, certainly I'll show up at the premiere for $50,000. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, all of the casts that we brought in guest stars, uh, we had a great time with. It seems like the dramatic dramatic actors like Robert Stack and these guys, they wanted to play comedy. They they really enjoyed playing comedy. And I remember Ed McMahon coming in. And the first question he had was, uh, what voice do you want me to do? <laughs> yeah. And I said, well, Ed McMahon would work. <laughs> okay. We can start there. <laughs> How about you be you? Okay. You know someone who went who went um who went uh, creditless on our show was Will Farrell. 
Really? Will Ferrell was in, yeah, he was in Bummer of Love. He played right. the uh, he played the guard that kept Daggett out of the concert. And he was like, whoa yeah. there, little fella. That was yeah. Will Ferrell. Yes. Yeah. And that was way before <laughs> SNL. That was way before he did anything as far as uh, his sketch comedy career goes. Because he didn't he didn't pop up on an SNL until mid to er, early 2000s. He yeah, was after that wave of uh, yeah, yeah, Spade and Sandler. Just, I thought he had just started. Interesting, because I don't I don't see his credit on it. Did, was he credited, Mitch? You know, I, it seems like this. There was something like he didn't want to be credited at yeah, all. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. interesting because I don't I don't see. His, <clears throat> I mean, he shows up in the cast, but he doesn't show up on the credits at the end of that episode. Yeah. Bummer of love. Yeah. So, because because uh, Vic uh, Vic knew him because they were in Groundlings together. Right. Yeah. So right. Was that his way in, or was he already on SNL? And because we had a wonderful casting um, director. Um, uh, Donna Grillo. Donna Grillo. Yeah, she was. You know, I think it was sort of like Mitch would go, "Hey, you think we could get?" And she'd go, "Okay." And, and that person, <laughs> yeah. that person would show, you know, and and you do, you know, <laughs> wow, you're really good at your job. Yeah, but, but she, <laughs> she would also go, "Well, uh, we'll have to check him out of the old actors' home for the day." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to get permission. Yeah, yeah. Mitch would ask him to go. The, yeah, and Donna would go. Yeah, I don't think he's that busy these days. Is uh, Buster <laughs> Keaton available? <laughs> really? <laughs> but you yeah, know, I was fun. wrong. We love Will Ferrell, ninety-five to two thousand two. So he was on SNL oh. at that point. So yeah, I thought he was. Yeah. Yeah. So we were talking about Ed Winter, who played Colonel Flag and Mash. Yeah. Uh, and and he was a big part of the show, playing scientist number one. Uh, and I remember toward the end of his run on the show, we had no clue that he was developing Alzheimer's, right? Yeah. Yeah. So he, so in the middle of a take or something, Rich would be talking, Nick would be talking, whatever, and Ed would just get up and walk out of the room right in the middle of the take. And at that time, we thought it was hilarious just because that's the nature of the show. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you got to yeah. do whatever you got to do. We thought and he was doing a bit or something, you know? Yeah. So bless his heart. We, we had so much fun with him. Yeah, Ed was great. Ed was great. Well, it sounds like you yeah, guys had a lot of uh, a lot of great people. Going back to Robert Stack for just a second, though, there's never been a person that's terrified me more as a kid than Robert Stack and Unsolved Mysteries. My mom would watch that when I was trying to go to sleep. The living room was right next to my brother and I's bedroom, and I would hear that reverberating off of the walls and just be terrified because he always ended with, and he's still at large, and they never found him. <laughs> What was it like having that spooky, spooky man walk through those doors and lend you guys a voice or two? Uh, I just remembered him. He, I was, I was out in the like our green room area when he arrived, and uh, I just ended up chatting with him because I loved uh, the Untouchables, mm -hmm. and it was syndicated late night um, in where I lived at the time in Milwaukee, uh, and it was it was. It was right in that uh, period where I discovered substances, and so our friends would sit around and we'd watch, we'd watch the show, and uh, you know any that and um, um, Dragnet, we we thought were comedies. I mean, we just it was hysterical <laughs> because they took themselves so seriously, and anybody who befriended Elliot Ness ended up dead. <laughs> and it, it, it was just like you know you could write the, you could write the episodes by formula because like oh no lady don't 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 take a shine to him it it, it doesn't go well and um you haven't seen the show have you lady but um so to, to talk about that but he came in and our studio is in burbank right and he grew up in beverly hills he's a, a, a la kid but a beverly hills kid and he said, my mother warned me never to go over to Burbank. You're going to get lost in all those farms. Because he remembered it from a time when that was just all orange groves and, uh, you know, that kind of thing. And then he talked to me about, um, he had uh, a friend of the family, wasn't a gun I'm blanking on her name, um, Clark Gable's last wife. Um, Carol, oh, not Carol Lombard. Yeah, Carol Lombard. Carol Lombard. Okay. Just talking about Carol Lombard was a friend of the family. And she started dating Clark Gable and she wanted to be uh, a guy's gal mm. and because he was a hunter and a fisher and all that other kind of stuff. And it turned out that Robert Stack was like Olympic level skeet shooter. 
Mm. So he went, so, so he took her out and gave her a couple of lessons on how to handle a shotgun. And he said, and to thank me, she gave me one of those glamour shots, you know, mm -hmm. like, where you see everything. Mm. And he said, well, I kept that picture for years. <laughs> and, and it was like, okay. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> nice, nice. Well, no, but okay, okay. It's kind of like, and, and then I was, I flashed on that in that, um, it was the Jack Benny, um, uh, what's his name's uh, version of To Be or Not To Be, that he was in it and she was in it. Right. Yeah. So uh, uh, anyway, but it was just like, yeah, okay. So this is a guy who goes back to like the 1930s kind of thing. And you're sitting there talking to him and you're going like, tell me more. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we can record later. I'm talking to Robert Stack. <laughs> you know, so yeah. anyway. He just came up to make a general conversation with me. He's like, you know, I was talking to Marlena. And, the, and it, took a, it took a few seconds, like, oh, my God, Marlena Dietrich. Because <clears throat> you don't, you never hear people mention people like that, you know. And uh, Yeah. It's, he's it a, he was, was <clears throat> awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I know, man. So. There's been one question that I've been I've been kicking around about Angry Beavers, and you know, Richard, you had a huge part in the other show that I thought would have done way better on Cartoon Network than it did ever did Nickelodeon. I always thought Angry Beavers and Invader Zim should have been on Cartoon Network. Did you ever have any interest in trying to pitch or trying to get Angry Beavers over to Cartoon Network before it was bought up by Nickelodeon? It really wasn't our our option because Nick, Nickelodeon owned it, so mm. they weren't going to they wouldn't have sold it to Cartoon Network. Same with, with in, Invader Zim. They would rather keep the rights, uh, sell the the the, um, the licensing to Hot Topic and continue to make money off of shows that aren't in production anymore because they're still making money off of, of both of the shows, you know, including, including Angry Beavers because we have stuff at Hot Topic at, at Angry Beavers also. So, um, so while I agree with you that I think that Angry Beavers was Nick, it was good for Nickelodeon, except that it was ahead of its time. And that's mm -hmm. what Mitch and I have always said that the show was ahead of its time. We were doing things that just weren't really done at that time. For example, as Mitch uh, alluded to earlier in the conversation, Nick and I overlapped each other constantly during the show which was like, like in recording world, it's a no, no on these shows. You don't talk over the other person, but Mitch said, no, I want you guys to talk over each other because that's how brothers are. Brothers interrupt each other all the time. They talk over each other all the time. So I want that feeling. It, it adds to the, um, yeah, to and, the, the mystique of the show. And, and thank you because editing the uh, EMRs was, always, <laughs> it, was always, it was such a pleasure going Oh, no, we can't do that. What? Well, you know, and, and, when, we have, when we'd have the guest stars come in, one of the things we would tell the guest stars, like, Richard and Nick overlap a lot. So just be ready for that. Plus, if you flub a line, keep going. We may use it. Yeah. So. That was true. <laughs> and and we, were getting, we were getting wild in our record sessions. Our record sessions would go on for a while. We were taking our time in the booth because we were having fun. But at one point, I remember uh, the executive producer, Mary Harrington, coming to Mitch and say, you know, it's great that these 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 guys are hurtling towards the sun or they're kersplunking with stump. But what brings us back to the show every week? And without a hesitation, Mitch said, they're brothers. That's it. They're brothers. That's why we come back week after week, because they're, it's a brother relationship. And to this day, you know, how many years later are we now? I don't know how many years later. It's, it's 75. 30. 20, almost 30 <laughs> years later. 75 years later. I yeah. go to conventions and people come up to my table all the time and say, oh my gosh, my brother was Norbert. I was Daggett. Or my sister was Norbert. I was Daggett. My dad loved that show. My yeah. dad loved that show. And that's when I felt... Um, really uh validated because that's what mitch's vision was was that it was uh, uh it was a family relationship and that that's yeah. Yeah. you know and we were ahead of our time we really were so but i think it's, it was also um nicktoons and, and nickelodeon in general um 
we got in very shortly after Ren and Stimpy, right? Yeah. And Nick was like trying to establish its street cred. And so they were bringing in animators that were doing edgy stuff, even though they weren't necessarily completely to the Nickelodeon brand. And so they were willing to take a lot of risks. And 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 I read, I learned, I learned everything I what little I know about animation from working on Angry Beavers. And most of the other, um, you know, if you go to like, uh, especially at the time, the Warner Brothers and Disney they were factories they had art departments they had all these kinds of things that that kind of pushed out uniform product why you could always look at a disney cartoon and go it's a disney cartoon or you know warner brothers cartoon but every time we were still in that phase where we were all like one-off productions mm -hmm. and uh, when we came in we started at gunther wall which is an independent production house but then as we moved out of there Mitch kind of put together like the whole production team. And so the show has a unique look and the shows in Nickelodeon all had that unique look because there was no backgrounds department. There was no character designs, props departments like there were in the other studios where there would tend to be kind of a top down style directive and all that other kind of stuff. Everything was like, we're putting on a show in the barn. <laughs> it was kind of like that kind of <laughs> that kind of ethic <laughs> in, in in animation right so that you you would get these shows that were unique and um but also know, keith, keith, but also keith you brought in i think the writers the majority of the writers were live action comedy writers yeah well that's yes. that was the yeah, kind of thing we brought in hmm. john writers. and glenn john, <clears throat> and glenn were... john and glenn <clears throat> live action i mean vic brought them in vic wilson who was <clears throat> Brownling, John Laney wrote for Spy Magazine, and um, and so the people that we were bringing in as as writers were coming from like, well, we we just do gags, you know. It, it wasn't kind of like we we were, and in fact, we're all pretty much new to animation, so it was a a, a different thing there. And, and if, as long as we're name dropping, mm -hmm. John and Glenn, who um, uh, John Rico and Glenn Ficarra who uh, directed a movie called Crazy Stupid Love. I was I in it because of John and Glenn. Because yeah. of John and Glenn. John and, John and Glenn. So they did that in WTF with Tina Fey. Anyway, they're on the set one morning, uh, John told me. They were on the set one morning, and Emma Stone comes running in. You know, for, she was doing a, a, a shot early in the morning. She comes running in and goes like, you guys wrote Angry Beavers! <laughs> and she... Was like a, I love that show when I, I love that show when I was a I love that show when I was a little girl. This I wasn't like, on the I wasn't on the set with her that day. <laughs> I just I just improvised with Steve Carell for the for the like a full day, which was fun. Oh yeah, yeah. but it, but anyway, but so as long as we're you know trying to get some star power into this podcast, yeah. you, can, <laughs> you guys are all the star power we need, man. I mean, I wanted to piggyback off of what Keith said for just a second. Uh, you know, as a, as a little kid watching the show, I appreciated the voice acting. I appreciated the cartoons and everything that went into it. And as I got older and I started looking at the credits and actually looking at the medium that is animation, Mitch, I'm not going to blow smoke up your ass. You had some of the best background artists. You had some of the best animators. You had some of the best writers on Key's side. You had some of the best voice actors on Richard's side. You know, you guys had a beautifully perfect show. Watching this 20 years later, you know, past my prime of me and my brothers getting into fights like, you know, Richard's character and, and Nick's character would, you know, and looking at it just with the, with the, no, no, nothing against you, Richard, but just hitting mute and just watching the art scroll by, right? I was amazed at the three episodes that you gave me that you said were were just so special to you, those three. Looking at the art was, it was just, I was blown away. And this is 95. You had said it, you know, this is three years after the big three came out of Nickelodeon and Doug, Rugrats, and Ren and Stimpy. So animation, especially in Nickelodeon, was really starting to ramp up. But you didn't have too many shows to pull artists from. You had a, a plethora of of writers and live action that you guys were pulling from, a plethora of voice actors you guys were pulling from. But Nickelodeon Studios didn't have an animation studio just yet. It, it was very grassroots. So, like I said, hats off to you, Mitch, for for building the team that you built. Well, thank you. And it's it's one of those uh, 
serendipitous moments where you get the right people at the right time and yeah. uh, you probably put it together ever again. You know, it just, yeah. it just okay. I, I say this all the time. I met Mitch gave me my first break in animation. <clears throat> and I say it to everyone that if it, Mitch is what started me off, um, anyone asks me that I've been fortunate in my career, Mitch is always the first person I mention because, you know, I'd never done animation. You know, I'd done, I had done Power Rangers, but that was dubbing. But yeah. Mitch was the first person where I was allowed to be free to play. And we weren't married to the storyboards at Nickelodeon. Mitch was like, let's do it, let's do it, let's do it. And I'm like, I love that process. But in talking about the 90s cartoons, one of the things that always kind of hurts a little bit more than anything in, in, our, in our 30 year history is that whenever they do like the Nicktoons of the 90s, the Beavers are usually kind of forgotten in those things. They it, always it, are. Like when like Nickelodeon will play Rugrats, they'll play Doug, they'll play Red and Stimpy, they'll play, they'll even play, you know, Wild Thornberries or, or, mm -hmm. or Rocket Power. But I'm always kind of a little sad that there's no, there's a lot of times the Beavers are forgotten in those, those, those uh, special weekend you know, why is that 90s? I've never know. understood that. I, I've never understood it. I, for, to be honest with you, between my history with the way they forget it with Angry Beavers and then Invader Zim, I began to think seriously it had something to do with me. I really, really did. I'm not kidding, but yeah. so well, there you go. And there you yeah. go. I, I, really, way, I really felt that, yeah. I, I mean, circling back around to the art side, and, and um, Mitch had. Mitch was working as a, a professional in animation, like basically since he was a child. And he had had a long history by the time we came to the show of working at a place like Hanna-Barbera. And he brought in, you know, when you were talking about bringing in the hearse, a lot of the, a lot of the art team were very experienced artists. And like that beautiful look to the layouts that Cliff was able to nail the... The, what is it, the term from Frank Geary? The curvilinear. The, the, you said there's going to be there's going to be no straight lines. You said there's going to be no straight lines inside the dam. And Cliff kind of very calmly looks at me and says, "Like, yeah, okay, and I'm going to go outside. For, I'm going to go outside for a well deserved cigarette. Remember that? Well, yes. I would always I would always ask Cliff, "Where are you going? Outside for a well deserved cigarette." <laughs> he he could and 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 also. Mitch is an amazing artist, amazing from just standpoint of like that weird thing he does where he's got a picture in his head and then he starts at the corner of the page and draws it all out perfectly proportional. You can just look at that and you go like some kind of a strange demon or something going on there. But but Cliff again had that, that thing and um, yeah. uh, Frank Furlong. Yes. Frank Furlong was amazing. And it was just these guys that came on and like, like I said, they wouldn't, they wouldn't flinch. Then Mitch would ask them for something ridiculous and then they would just go like, yeah, okay. And uh, that, that was, that was a, a fortunate thing. I mean, you don't put together that kind of a team without having, I don't know, knowledge of that kind of talent and those people and having worked with them and, and all the experience that Mitch had already when we did the show. And well, Mike, Mike Sabias and RP, those they were kind of beginners, right? They were, they were, they were young into it. And um, I mean, RP, she <clears throat> had a couple of years ago. She had um, she does folk art, Armenian folk art, and, and uh, she was uh, her some of her stuff was featured at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. They and in a. Nice. Like one of the exhibitions that they had done and then and and well and Sabios is I'm working with him too and he's just um he's gone off into cultural animation and things like that and, and Patty uh, Patty was amazing Patty, Patty was amazing. Patty was wonderful Patty and was let's wonderful. not forget Jerry Roshan yeah oh Sorry. yeah yeah and then and of course Mario yes oh, yeah. Mario yeah. Mario, Deanna, yeah, yes. and, uh, yeah. No, I mean, there's just all, and and we're still working um, on this uh, on this Armenian project. Maurice is doing BGs and layouts. Mm -hmm.
that's oh, yeah. Maurice Morgan. Wow. And, and you look at his stuff and he's not using like computer duplication. He does these incredible layouts that again, the perspective is perfect on the detailing. It's just, I, I'm as, as, as Mitch said, I can't draw a circle. So I just watch these people do their thing and I'm kind of in awe. And, uh, and we just, but we just had so many good talented people that he was able to bring together. And, um, you know, yeah. Yeah. I am. I want to go back to that question that Julian asked you. Why do you think that is that we're often, for, we're often, often, according often. to Keith, often, <laughs> yeah, often. forgotten in those nineties tunes, retro things that they do. I've got one of two theories. And if you want to put on the aluminum foil hat, we can go with that one first and then we can go to the second <laughs> one. Uh, the first one, I really think, I didn't know too much about the final episode that never got put out, right? There was a whole bunch of wall break and <laughs> no. apparently there's a whole bunch of rules <laughs> no. and all that other shit. Oh, man, so, that well, was... the, only reason, the only reason I bring that one up is because whenever I have somebody coming on, right? I always go and say, hey, I've got such and such coming on. What questions would you like to get asked? Literally, every question that started out, probably the first, I, I've, I've never gotten this many answers, this much hit on social media within the first half hour of posting. Usually it'll take a couple hours. It was just ding, 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 ding. And almost half of them were when is uh when is the 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 reboot or when is the continuation gonna happen? Uh what's up with the final episode? Why was that never released? And it was just those two back and forth, back and forth, like the first 15, 20 questions. So I have to assume it was a grudge because you said that it was Invader Zim and both anger angry beavers two shows that you worked on, two shows that were so good and so fun, especially for my generation. Those hit at such a, a, an interesting a, an interesting time. So that's the first one if you want to wear a tinfoil hat. Maybe they're mad. Maybe they're upset still. Maybe they're holding a grudge. But I can't imagine too many people that were in power back then are in power now at Nickelodeon yeah, Studios. They, so maybe they, they that's not the case. The time. Yeah. And going back to my original point uh, or my original uh, question on the Cartoon Network versus Nickelodeon, I really think that if if the show would have been pitched originally to Cartoon Network, it would have lasted. It, it probably still on TV right now. Same thing with Invader Sim. I don't think they understood what they had. It was not the sensibility. Nothing against Nickelodeon. I've always been a Cartoon Network guy. Nothing against Nickelodeon whatsoever. All right, you can look on the back of my walls back here. I've got a couple of your characters, Richard. Um, <laughs> Uh, the Angry Beavers are over here. You know, I, I was yeah. drawing on the wall before everybody uh, logged in. Oh, today, so I didn't cool. get to finish hitting the stuff. Um, but I don't think those shows match Nickelodeon. I think they match perfectly with Cartoon Network. I just don't think that they knew what they had. They see this this humor that wasn't... Nickelodeon always felt like my little brother's channel. It always mm -hmm. felt like that Y7, Y8. You know, Cartoon yeah. Network always felt like it was that not quite teenager, maybe just turning a teenager. So you still got that weird sensibility. And that was what Cartoon Network was. And that's what those two shows in particular were for me. Those were the ones that everybody in middle school and high school were talking about when I was going and when I was still watching cartoons, right? So yeah. those are my two theories. You either pissed off Nickelodeon or they just didn't know what they had and they didn't know how to market you guys' show. I, I yeah, go ahead, Keith. Oh, no, I, 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 I think going back circling back to that thing of they're not being a consistent uh, studio and a consistent style um there also wasn't a consistent marketing department mm -hmm. and a consistent vision of what the brand was and again it was kind of one off because when we got greenlit linda saminski was just making her way out of the network who's like a lover of animation and just everywhere she one goes. of my favorite people in the world Yes. Yeah. Everywhere, everywhere she went, she just did. She did edgy stuff. You know, she kind of like followed her own muse that way. And um, Mary Harrington, who uh, was responsible for bringing me in and um, you know getting the thing greenlit and being our you know our exec through you know th through getting the show up and running, um, they had. They were kind of like animation geeks in a way. They weren't really kind of like, you know, programming executives. So it was almost like they were enabling us to try and get away with as much as we could. 
and you know and so that that edginess that kind of came in there and and he, like i say look at ren and stimpy my god that is so mm. not appropriate for children <laughs> if you look at the show and so i think that they always kind of struggled with that and and um and then it, god bless her remember jerry laborn i think she, she was she was just going out yeah. at the same time yeah, yeah. She, and she yeah. she greenlit the show and she also stood up for the title yeah. because remember we were getting it was kind of going back and forth of the sexual entendre of beavers was like they were worried like we can't have a show that uses the word beavers what's yeah. the sexual entendre about a beaver keith can you explain this to the to the younger be, generation it would it would be somewhere in the alluded to visually as a metaphor for okay. life and the life process by Mitchell in the uh, in the credits <laughs> opening credits for the show where the beavers emerge from what appears. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, is the only the only animal that Mitch could draw was a beaver. That's the that's <laughs> the whole story. Actually, the only thing I could draw is a pointy bird. It's a pointy bird. We called it a beaver. The yeah. pointy birds, yeah, the pointy birds. But it's, but that, but anyway, I I think that there's something in. There was always sort of I won't say an identity crisis, but there were always was somewhat of a a much more f uh, flexible identity to Nick Tunes than there were to the other other places that had a definite brand. And I think you're you identified where Cartoon Network was coming from correctly. That you know they. They appeal to that tween kind of audience and stuff with the, the tone of their shows. And Nickelodeon could be all over. It could be Angry Beavers. It could be Doug. You know, and. But they didn't have the marketing team to put that together. And then I'm so glad you brought up Linda Siminski because I just had her on a couple weeks ago. I've had her on three or four times. She's one of those people that I consistently reach out to. She is was one she sober? of. What's that? Was she sober? Yeah, I think so. She seems sober. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, like I said, she, she's, like, oh. she's one of those, <laughs> she's one of those people that I always reach out to whenever I have questions, her Fred Seibert, he's another guy I can go to and I can get an honest right. answer, um, right, you know, and oh, he's such a great dude. Um, he's actually coming on in a couple of weeks. We're going to do, it's kind of like what we're doing now. Uh, we're going to do one with the cow and chicken with David Feast and, uh, Fred and then Dean Taylor, the art director, a whole bunch of people are coming on. We're going to get Charlie on that one too, Charlie Adler. Cause he did almost <laughs> every, him and D Bradley Baker did almost every fucking voice for that show. Um, so we're going to do a reunion show for that one too. But Linda Semensky, it is everybody that I've ever had, uh, you know, on my show that's had an interaction with her has, has said the same thing. Like she was that creative buffer zone between, executives at a cartoon studio or an animation studio and the creative talent that they hired to do a specific job. Her job was to keep execs in their suits, the artist to the best of her abilities in their studios yeah. drawing and try to be on schedule and give them enough room to both succeed and fail. Right. And then keep, like I said, keep the, she was like a buffer is, is what I'm getting at. You know what I mean? So it, it's, I think that would have been a, a, a somebody that could have helped you guys out as far as as keeping Nickelodeon or keeping those two shows if she would have stayed over at Nickelodeon. I don't think Cartoon Network would have went as far as it did if they didn't have Linda Semensky. But I think if you would have had somebody like a Linda Semensky over there, you know, keeping those guys and gals out, you guys might have went a little bit longer and uh, you guys would have been always remembered. So, yeah, you know, because we worked, yeah. we worked with Linda on the pilot. She mm -hmm. was appointed the pilot. Yeah. Uh, so we we work through her, you know, the mm -hmm. story and everything else. Uh, I can't remember the name of the story, but uh, it was Snowbound. Snowbound, and it's funny because I've got the background hanging on my living room, and I can't remember that. This is what happens. Okay. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> but so so we've come back around to blaming Linda Siminski. Let's do that. <laughs> you know. Okay. In all, in all fairness, <laughs> I think that I think the one thing that is, I think is like misunderstood about the Beavers is that is that people always said, "Oh, you guys got canceled. You got canceled." It wasn't that. We did a hundred and three, a hundred and five. How how many? How many? We did, did sixty two half hours, and the reason we did do hours. and the reason we didn't do sixty five is because two of the episodes with a movie was the day the world got screwed up, right? And and then when we couldn't get that last episode made that you're talking about, the, yeah. we did the we did the sisters pilot. Correct. 
Simply Sisters. So, I mean, we did do 65 half hours, which, you know, equates to, you know, 130 11 minute episodes, yeah. um, which was a lot, you know, for animation. Yes, we didn't go on as long as Rugrats or SpongeBob or any of these, these other ones, but we did do 130 and it would have been nice to have continued on, but I guess, I guess, you know, when SpongeBob came along, you know, that was kind well, of part of it. There. Part of it was, is that, uh, in a trip to, on a trip to New York, I was told by one of the executives, Mitch, next year is going to be the year of the, of beavers. the beavers. We're going to focus on the beavers. And then there was a management change and the new management didn't want to have anything to do with the old management ideas and wanted to bring in cat dog. That so we cat dog. So we kind of got bypassed for our moment. Yeah. Even though we were only second to the Rugrats, I think uh, we and Arnold, the uh, Beavers and Arnold, were yeah, right can, up yeah. right underneath Rugrats in the ratings all the yeah. time. But never, yeah, never underestimate what a regime change does at a network or a studio, <laughs> because it's not only must. It, in order for them to succeed and to justify that they're the new hire, they have to put their shows up, put their points on the board. Yeah. And, and and unless something is really kind of running that is too big to fail, they can, it, you become the redheaded stepchild. You become, you know, you just become like, well, that was, that was Mary Harrington's show, but I'm, you know, what, what do I gain in my career as a VP or whatever programming and uh, of animation by, keeping her show on or, or, or fostering it. So you kind of, it, it's almost like dying on the vine. In a way. You know, you, they just, they just stop putting energy and resources into your project because this new one of theirs, this is genius. This is, this is and this is what's going to make them. That's how execs advance and, you know, get things. So it's, it, it's, it, it's, it's part of the process. And I think that, that we were caught in that thing because it, isn't that, um, that's when Mary stopped running the studio. She went over and started producing shows like Invader Zim, and then yeah. and then and then everything and then everything kind of got pushed to New York too. That was the other thing. It's like most of the execs who had programming decisions and were were giving us notes. They were sending in these junior execs, like so much cannon fodder, to talk to the to talk to the guys at Angry Beavers, and we were really kind of. <clears throat> You make a, a really good point about the regime change because that is like 90% of, if not more, of the issue. When yeah. um, for years after Invader Zim, they kept coming back to Jonah to do more shows, and, and uh, he was like, No, I don't want to have anything to do with it. I want to do when we finally did the Florpus movie, the regime that was in there loved us, they wanted to do as much as they could with Zim. And then um, it took so long for the movie to get done that by the time we, we actually premiered the movie, the entire regime had been changed and they were not fans of the show again. And that was the end of that. So Keith is absolutely right. Regime, we, we, we suffered through a lot, two regime changes when we were doing Beavers. So that changed a lot. And I wanted to add one point for, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I just wanted to add one thing about what uh, uh, Keith was saying about when we started out, and Nickelodeon was fairly fresh and new at that time, is that their philosophy, and I was told this by Herb Scannell, who was head of Nickelodeon at the time. The philosophy of Nickelodeon at that time was, if the parents don't like it, we're doing something right. And that mm. was their philosophy. And that's why you had a Ren and Stimpy. And that's why you had a Beavers. You know, because if the parents were going to be offended, this is good. But then uh, well, you have to make money, you know. So you change your way of thinking. Well, they hit that on. They hit the nail on the head of my household because I wasn't allowed to watch watch Rocco. Um, I had to sneak around for a little bit to watch Angry Beavers, and there was one more show that I can't think of. Um, I was never a Ren and Stimpy guy, but uh, there was one more show, and my my older sister always ratted me out. She was diabolical she was like hey julian's watching that show you told me couldn't watch rugrats that was the one um and speaking of rugrats because i want to circle back to that do you guys think and this is a hypothetical question uh i've been told that rugrats didn't really hit until it hit reruns that first season it was right. good i think when i had paul germain on uh you know co-creator with that one with klasky and chupo he said that you know it was it did good numbers but when it hit 
reruns for that first season, that's when it started picking up. Everybody started paying attention. Do you guys think if you would have gotten that same kind of um, gift of getting reruns like like Rugrats was? I mean, obviously, there wasn't as much content as on TV when they were on it than when you guys were on it. But do you think if, they, if you would have had that same kind of chance to have so many reruns that you guys would have found that second life and you guys would have found more episodes, more seasons? I think so. Yeah, I do. I think I think for me, what happened was. As you know, you, you mentioned Rugrats. Well, Rugrats was still um, a classy Chupo show. So mm -hmm. it wasn't fully owned by Nickelodeon. But as soon as they got SpongeBob, SpongeBob was theirs. Hook, line, and sinker, it was theirs. All yeah. the money that they were making, it was SpongeBob. And so uh, I think a lot of the shows from the early 90s um, or the mid 90s or 90s in general kind of got like, well, we don't completely own that one. They still own some of the, you know, the the marketing rights, you know, for the yeah. for the for the swag. But with, you know, SpongeBob, we got it all. We can control it all. And so, you know, I used to have a a, a saying with my kids because my kids grew up um, during this time. Like my my mm -hmm. my my oldest son was actually mentioned thanks to Mitch on one of the episodes. It was I think it was Tree of Hearts. I think it was Tree of Hearts where uh Daggett and Norbert are opening the mail and uh, Norbert goes hey Daggett look at this Richard Horvitz had a baby boy Jake Elliott born <laughs> April 11th and and Daggett goes Ew, who's Richard Horvitz and Norbert goes nobody <laughs> and that kid is now 27 years old right um, that's so cool which is so weird <laughs> I mean his first like his first Halloween we spent at Mitch's house um yes. but and now he's 27 which is weird but anyway um the the thing about that was that 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 time when um when we still had our own shows and everything but then spongebob comes along like i was saying and it's suddenly they're they're making money hand over fist on spongebob and they own all the rights to it but there was so, a but there was a there was also something though that happened right after spongebob which is to me, and this is my perception because I was pitching shows, I was going around pitching ideas and things like that at the time, is Nick, Nick Toons kind of lost their their way, their nerve, because they became a, they became an acquisitions network. Mm -hmm. They started going out there and getting the Ninja Turtles and all. They were looking for things to fit their brand and they were no longer developing in-house. I, really, I think it happened right after spongebob spongebob huge hit you know produced in-house from that you know uh team and that uh whatever you want to say that sort of uh that ethic or uh aesthetic and then all, and, yeah and, and but also just we develop our own shows right and that was what what, what nick tunes was doing i'm not saying we but that was <laughs> That was what Nick Toon was doing through the 90s. And then they kind of just all of a sudden, again, and it was probably a corporate kind of decision where it would be like, well, you know, it's it's a lot safer. Let's just go out and get shows that somebody's already done and looks like something that we could show. And uh, they stopped really developing, I think, in-house. Um, they just, and some of that had to do, I guess, with some of those people um, just kind of going away that, that had that nerve circling back to Linda Siminski and Mary Harrington and the people who were like these animation lovers and put that energy into the development process. Oh, sorry, that's Carlos. Um, and, uh, okay. he and, and Carlos show too. is Rocky? Is that Rocco? No, it's, it's, Car it's Carlos. Um, anyway, but I'm just, you know, you know what I'm saying? I, I, I got that vibe for it. And then one other thing completely out of left field was when we were getting the notes about sorry my dog um you're fine what we got the notes about we couldn't have the beavers say shut up mm. do you remember that oh Mitch? yes Hush that up. was uh alley oops yep the bowling but it was just scene. but who was there was a, there was an exec who was so worried that his kids would watch it and we would get these notes about imitatable behavior yeah you know as if like any but the irony of that note was, was that you had Angelica on Rugrats saying, shut up, babies. So she was saying mm -hmm. shut up all the time. So it was like, pick and choose, I guess. But she said shut up all the time. So we tried to change it by bleeping it. 
which made it worse. Yeah. I said, let's bleep it. <laughs> and that just brought all the attention to oh, it. That, man. That, was, that was just like putting big quote marks around it, you know? Yeah, and then we ended up with, hush up, Dag! Hush up! <laughs> How much time hush. did you spend in the principal's office, Mitch? I was a pretty good boy. But I took yeah. it out on <laughs> <laughs> I just so, remember, you know, you remember that thing where the teachers would tell you, you know, if you keep behaving like this, you'll never amount to anything. And I just always wanted to send them like my guild checks and just kind of go like wrong, just wrong. Just I make money being a smart ass wrong. <laughs> and, you know, that, I well, that's why uh, that's why I was always screwed up, because my mother says, <laughs> If you become an animator, your face will freeze like that. <laughs> right. And I just didn't get it. <laughs> oh. Well, like I said, boys, I, I'm 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 really glad that uh that this show exists. Regardless of Nickelodeon plays this one, regardless of Nickelodeon plays in Theaters M. Richard, I'm gonna tell you right now, I don't have one friend that didn't grow up loving either of those two shows where this is an angry beaver show it's not so much an invaders m show but i i don't have one friend that didn't absolutely adore that show didn't have a t-shirt didn't have socks for christmas like one of my favorite parts of my day i i, I cook for a living right <clears throat> one of my favorite parts of the day is getting to pick out what socks i'm gonna wear right and i got gifted for christmas we had the uh what is that thing called secret santa and i was gifted some socks because that's what everybody knows me for at sock all the cartoon socks <laughs> and everything <laughs> I got a basket full of Invader Zim socks this this <laughs> Christmas, you know. So <laughs> I, I so cool. like I said, yeah. This this show that both of those shows, Angry Beavers in, included, these shows mean so much to so many of us. So if Nickelodeon doesn't know what they have, fuck them at the end of the day because I don't give a shit. Because my childhood was 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 an amazing childhood. It was a childhood worth living because of you three gentlemen and so many more that helped bring this show and those shows and so many more shows. All of these shows on the back of my wall, they gave me a reason to sit in front of a TV and veg out and enjoy and laugh and discuss this shit with my friends. I made friends because of Angry Beavers and Invader Sim. Yeah. Well, you should, yeah, that's good. You should know that when we were working on, on the show, Mitch, Keith, and I and the whole crew, we were making each other laugh. We were enjoying mm -hmm. our time together with each other with each other with no concept of what it would do out in the world. We had Except for idea. Mike. We didn't Except like Mike. We didn't like Mike. We did not like Mike. Is he ever going to do dang it again? But anyway. No, no. Um, I said Micah. Oh, my, oh. <laughs> D the name that shall not be mentioned. He's going to watch this. I can tell you he's going to see this. But anyway, um, we didn't know what what would what, what to expect but we were enjoying ourselves so much and i always i always equate it to like the carol burnett show where they made each other laugh which made us laugh we were spending our entire days making each other laugh um and so i'm so happy that that translated to you watching it on your tv at home or something but like i said to this day mitch and keith and i we could get together and we could laugh for hours and just at the silliest stupidest things no matter yeah. how many years go by I, I can count the hours that mitch and i would sit on his his porch and have a cigarette and a drink and we would laugh and laugh and laugh yes. and some of our best ideas came out of just us being silly at the same time so and, and, yeah. and i blame these guys for sort of wrecking my life because i <laughs> I continued to go on thinking like, well, that's what happens. That's what happens in this business. You you go in and you make each other laugh and you have a good time. And uh, that doesn't always happen. And uh, and uh, so when you get that kind of chemistry where you, you, you know, you still are working with some of the people, you still are friends with the people, you can still get together like this after yeah. I haven't seen these guys in a while. And and, and it's and it all clicks is um yeah that spoils you yeah I, I consider myself spoiled by this show you know that it was just kind of like well yeah but but, but with beavers we were we were laughing and we were making funny stuff and we're doing what can't we do that again yeah. keith i'm sorry we can't <laughs> this this is this is show business you have, you, you have to be able things. you have to be able to do it in six to eight episodes 
episodes and we have to know exactly what's going to happen on episode one and episode eight. Yeah. And if we can't, if you can't describe the first three seasons to us, no deal. That's what Mitch and I encountered when we were pitching some of our ideas together. That yes. Yeah. We, Mitch and I, Mitch and I actually did a pilot together that, that we, it was called Little Man Dan and His Big Fat Hand. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and um, right, it was really good. Down. Mitch and I still have uh, the uh, the demo from it. Well, it's, it was a fully animated five minute short, um, but originally it was called Little Man Dan. What was it? Little Booger. Man Dan and the Big. Wait, Booger Man Dan. Yeah, it was called Booger Man <laughs> Dan. That's what it started out as. I brought <laughs> Mitch's idea and <laughs> on his porch. I had a kid that I grew up with. And he always had just like a nose full of boogers. So he called him Booger Man Dan. And somehow through our getting together, it turned into Little Man Dan and his big fat hand. Yes. And it was about a, a kid that was born with a live action hand. And that hand was more popular than he was. And it was actually a really good idea. It was We sold it to the Disney Shorts program. And then the shorts program went out of business before our show actually aired, actually, but it was actually animated. So, well, they also didn't like the masturbation jokes. Yeah, they didn't like the masturbation. In fact, he's not kidding. We had already fully animated the thing with the opening credits, and some exec went, That sounds like masturbation. Little man Dan and his big fat hand, what's he doing with that hand? <laughs> And I think we had to change it to Little Man Dan and the Big Fat Hand, right? We That's just put right. the in there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we had a blast, though. That was fun. We had yeah. some good times. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, man. Well, like I said, I've had a good time. So what I figure we can do is we could rotate in a couple fans' questions. And there was a lot, ladies and gentlemen, so we'll try to answer as many as we can. Now, no okay. pressure, Richard. Nobody yes. knew that you two were coming on. I wanted to keep it a secret because as soon as I got the okay from Mitch, as far as him coming on, he was like, I'm going to reach out to a couple of guys and he reached out to you two. Okay. So this is all going to be a surprise. So a lot of these are uh, creator centric, but you guys have been on and this is your break and Keith, you guys helped each other make this beautiful show. So I have to imagine all you guys can answer these ones and Richard, no, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Oh, fuck, man. I can't think of the word I'm looking for, so I'm just going to roll with it. So yeah. just know that whenever we do have a voice actor on, we like to have somebody sing something, right? So I figure <laughs> if you know the song. Sing. Yes, sing. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, Char right. so Charlie Adler, if you remember yeah. Cow and Chicken, he played the yeah. red guy, right? The devil yeah, that bounced love, on his butt I love cheeks. Charlie. Dear friend of mine. Right. Yeah. So somebody wrote in, hey, Mickey, you're so fine. Hey, you're so fine. Hey, Mickey, right? They want him yeah. to sing that one. So I couldn't think of a song as far as that ballad, but I figured if you know uh, Tears for Fear, shout. I figured that's fitting for Daggett, right? Yeah. So what? how would Dag sound singing t or shout from Tears from Fears? <laughs> shout, shout, let it all out. <laughs> These are the things that we talk about, Norbert. <laughs> you didn't disappoint richard you, the bar was set very high with charlie yeah, well, and i think you're when the you bar said now. tears for fears i'm like there we go but the thing that oh, you there missed we go. richard can sing but he can also dance like davy jones of the monkeys that's true I I can't, you can't Oh, I could hide neath the wings of the bluebird as she sings Oh, so you got a two oh, we, I spent a one. lot. Of, Mitch has a jukebox in his house, <laughs> and I would spend hours. Funny enough, he kept making me put my own quarters in, but that's a whole other thing. What a dick! <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, it's the same thing he's mentioned earlier, where I was asking girls, little girls, they want candy. Yes, he didn't get it right. He's like, "Hey, little girl, would you like to buy some candy?" Exactly, <laughs> buy some candy. Um. <laughs> But yeah, so we I used to spend a lot of time at Mitch's house just singing Heartbeat, It's a Love Beat from yeah. Tony DeFranco, the DeFranco family's friend yes. family. And I am now friends with Tony DeFranco. I haven't told you that, <laughs> Mitch. Yes. That's All awesome. Right. Yeah, I know. All right, Julian, your next question. All right, man, we got one here. Uh, will Angry Beavers Respooted ever get made? If not in animated form, are you going to try and make it a comic book form like the Invader Zim <laughs> Revival comics? I don't know. Um, 
we couldn't even get in to pitch it uh, at Nickelodeon. So I don't know. Uh, I, I'm assuming we'd have to get permission from Nickelodeon to do even do the comic book. Hmm. Uh, I never, it never crossed my, my mind to do a comic book with the Beavers. We, we were talking about getting those furry suits together and doing it as like uh, busking in the subways. Of New <laughs> <laughs> Although we did do one comic strip in the Nickelodeon magazine with the Beavers. We did one short comic strip, but we did. Yeah. But yeah, I, I don't know if you guys got any. Idea. I don't know if you guys got any swing, but I know. Uh, well, uh, DC DC's doing it again with the Hanna Barbera properties. They did a Scooby Doo, a Flintstones. They did their whole universe. I believe Dynamite has done some of the Nickel. I think Dynamite did both Rocco and Invaders. I think it was Dynamite. Um, you know, it goes DC, Marvel, Image, and then you know, uh, obviously Dynamite is like the big four that rounds out the top five for for comic books. But I don't know if that's something that you guys could pitch or even bring up. But maybe Dynamite could you know swing their dick around and say, "Hey, we'd like to do this type of thing." Well, they they're, they're a great publisher because I've got a bunch of their compilations of Creepy and Eerie and Vampirella, all that mm -hmm. stuff they did mm -hmm. at uh, Warren Magazine. It, mm -hmm. It's beautifully, really nice. Well, I think it it would probably have to be something in the Viacom family because, you know, I mean, all of these, uh, even though the streamers have come in and kind of shaken up the business a lot, you still have the big six media companies that like, you know, they complain that the business is going this way, but they, they own everything, right? I mean, Viacom is, is Paramount, Paramount Plus Network now, they're MTV Networks. And CBS. There's CBS, CBS billboards, and all of that, and that's that's their empire. And so, if they were to have some kind of a publishing, one, then that would be a much easier deal to do in house because these companies are very, very, what would you say, Probably. jealous, jealous of their own properties. And once they develop them, they'd rather leave them sit on a shelf and die than give them to somebody else. Yeah, and Such and bullshit. see it make, and see and see it, but to, you know, but to see it make money, it's. Uh, as I often quote, Bob Dylan said, money doesn't talk, it swears. And uh, mm -hmm. there's this corporate ethic that's increasingly taken over the business, which is why, like you say, DC Comics, well, DC Comics is uh, Warner Discovery, right? So, mm -hmm. duh. I mean, <laughs> they'll, they'll take those properties that they own, you know, which is Warner Brothers, who bought Hanna Bar who owned Hanna-Barbera, yes, Mitch? Didn't, uh, yeah, they, they own Hanna-Barbera yeah. and Ruby Spears, they own Hanna Hanna Barbera. Barbera. And so, you know what I mean? So that that structure and that way that the business is done from a media standpoint very often dictates where these properties can go or get, re, you know, revived. I would think that once a streaming service gets started, like Paramount Plus, they might come back around to wanting to take some of these Nickelodeon properties or maybe even create their own streaming thing. But, you know, they all looked around once Nick, uh, once Netflix started putting stuff out there that they were like going like, yeah, stream this stuff. We don't care. And then suddenly Netflix is making billions and they're like, wait a minute. Suddenly we, we care now. And so yeah. Disney, Paramount Plus, you know, uh, Universal, everybody has a streaming service suddenly. You know, that's, you know, it's just like, uh, I don't know, it's just the, <laughs> the way the world works uh, on the business side, at, at least from my perspective. But anyway. But I'm a commie. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah. And that's just the way I roll. It's you know. It's... And I'm a semi commie. <laughs> there you go. What's that make you, Richard? We got a commie. We got a semi commie. What does that make you? Are you Poland right now? Are you I, neutral? I, I, I'm neutral. I'm 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 <laughs> I'm, I'm Switzerland. Switzerland. Well, God damn it! Poland was invaded in World yes, War II. God right. damn it! Yes, I'm Switzerland. <laughs> Really Richard, Richard, you'd make a good colon. You'd make a good colon. I make a good colon. colon. <laughs> I make a good colon. You take a little whiskey, and you add a little shot of vermouth. That no, that's not a good colon. Yeah. You make a good colon. A good colon cleanse. Yes, yeah. a good colon cleanse. <laughs> Yeah. We're lickety splits inspired by any kind of actual snack food. Anytime I eat a pretzel combo, I can't help but think of Norb. That Jeez. was. That was something we came up in, with in the writer's room, and it's the, the what is it, the maple treat you split and lick. And it was yeah. just, it was, it was, came off lickety split off that. We did a lot of stuff, which I'm, I'm proud of, happy, and, and, and 
Mitch indulged us where we went back and used just old antique language that you know you could go back into and uh and put it back out there and it seemed new to kids but like you know something happening lickety split you know was and Keith Keith always used to found a way to slip in a bunch of Canadian things in that in this show yeah. what in the name of who what names do we have uh buckskin pants are you talking about Norbert yeah. Remember that but one, we, Keith? What it's just name? like you kind of try, you try to go to the, that. This was the thing is that um, we we had a saying, which was goofy is good, silly is better. Because okay. you couldn't do adult stuff, you know, and, and we, we snuck a few sort of entendres and a few kind of. Uh, oh, we did. Little, a few <laughs> risque, risque things in. But for the most part, you're just trying to get laughs um by doing goofy silly stuff and we also had the mandate that nickelodeon um the comedy had to be evergreen so you couldn't do what you do on late night talk shows where you talk about you know uh you know how about that taylor swift you know it's just like, mm -hmm. like you you couldn't do cultural references you couldn't do those things so we ended up going for stuff as, as much as we could in the ideas and in the comedy that was kind of like just out there in the ether that was like I say go old timey or just go silly and goofy and and uh, yeah. that was where we that's where we kind of tried to find the stuff to you know to get the comedy rolling and then uh, and then I, I learned something I learned a valuable lesson which I'm violating now you never <laughs> pont which you never pontificate in front of animators because there will be a picture of you doing horrible things with animals that gets passed around the room. We would get these execs would come in to like lay down the law or tell us something important about Nickelodeon's new vision. And suddenly you're sitting at this table going, uh-huh, bored out of your mind. And this little picture of a, a wonderful sort of caricature of that person. Oh no. With, <laughs> with, a, with a monkey doing something in their ear. And then, and then you go, and and then you pass it along, and then all of a sudden, the monkey had a bird holding it over the person's <laughs> head, pooping, and, oh, and, 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 and and then they would. But it was just all of, but all of them. It's this wonderful <laughs> passive aggressive Mitch, Mitch, uh, Mitch. animation thing going on, where everybody was just looking at that person, going like, "And this is what the wonderful thing's going to happen at Nickelodeon." And then there was this picture of them going around the table, just of like, yeah, horrible, horrible wonderful funny things ha happening to them that and i still that got that folder well you do <laughs> oh. to, to digress for a moment there's still a line from the show that haunts me to this day to What's this that? day i do still so. wake up feeling that i never got it the way mitch wanted it or the way it should have been done and um it was this one look norbert Fun, sun, and limbo beach parties. Do you remember? Do you Mitch? still think about that? Yeah, I remember. Can never get that line exactly how Mitch wanted it. And Mitch was like, oh, that was good. That was good. I knew, though, that I didn't do it. It was something <laughs> that. Do you remember the line? It was that fun, sun, and limbo beach parties. That was the, that was yeah. the first season. That was. Uh, yeah. Dick, Dick wrote that script. What was it called? Yeah. Um, was that Beach Beavers a Go Go or something? It was or? Beach Beavers of a Go Go. Yeah. yeah. I remember yeah. the line. Yeah. Fun, sun. And Why does it haunt you? Parties. Because I Why never thought that you? I got it the way that Mitch wanted it, and I thought it could have been funnier somehow. Mitch moved on, and Mitch rarely moved on if he didn't get get it the way he wanted it. But I knew it <laughs> in my head to this day that it, I still didn't nail it the way that I could have done it or that Mitch wanted it. But I couldn't figure out the the humor in the delivery. I just couldn't. So. Do you think he's playing the long game? Do you think he actually loves the Eventually, way you did it? Eventually, I'll get just... it. Uh, no, yeah. no, no, no. Yeah. He would tell me, he would tell me, I think he's remembering <laughs> it now. He's like, yeah, no, yeah, he never did really do it exactly how I heard it. But, <laughs> but anyway, that was 30 years ago now. What are you going to do? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Maybe if they ever. my career right then and there. Way to go, Mitch. You could have ruined yeah, this man's Mitch, career. Jesus. Career. But, you know, the thing that I remember about uh, Richard playing Daggett is he's not even on camera. And there's sheep. There's sheep in the other room. He's in the other room with sheep. And and 
Norbert to the bathtub with a wash rag over his face saying, what are you doing in there, Dag? Practicing animal husbandry? Yes. <laughs> did you write that? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, I did. There were a lot of those things we slipped in, like when when it was, I think it was when when Dag is having the party with the sheep up in the tree. Oh, get off the couch. You know you're not supposed to be a, you're a naughty sheep. Well, that's <laughs> That's what I was talking about, taking some of those, like I say, those obscure expressions and things like that. Like, you know, I remember being in the Boy Scouts and there was animal husbandry mm. marriage. And it's such an odd term, right? You know, someone who cares for animals, that's animal husbandry. And But it's like... It sounds so weird. It, it, it just sounds, come on. Somebody did yes. something. Somebody did something <laughs> wrong with an animal. It's what it sounds like, you know. Out there fucking squirrels. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh. Next question, Julia. Next question. Well, this this next one is very fitting for the topic we're on now. Yes. What notes were you giving about the characters in the show? Was there anything that the network forced you to change? We we just heard Animal Husbandry made it into the show. What didn't make it into the show that you guys can remember that you were forced to change? Here's here's the one that I remember that <laughs> we all had a big laugh about this. Uh, we had broadcast standards and uh, we had a show where it took place in a football stadium. Yes. And uh, the, uh, the the Zamboni or something goes nuts and goes up in, into the stands and like kills thousands of people, you know, and nothing was said. Just most it, of that. It's just killing everybody in the stands. Nothing was said. And then we did the show where the bummer of uh, the one where they night of the clods or what uh, food of the clods. Yeah. yeah, that's the one with the uh, so Harris, yeah. Norbert is sleepwalking and he's got this little hatchet. He's chasing Daggett around the room while he's sleepwalking. And the broadcast and this comes in is like, you know, we're kind of concerned about him trying to kill Norbert with a hatchet. Could you make the hatchet oversized? <laughs> so and I'm like Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, the bigger the tax, the better. Well, my, my favorite note, and I will not name names who gave the note, but it was an exec giving us a note where early on, especially in that first season, because we really had done the pilot, but we changed a lot. And so the show was developing, right? You're, you're coming up with what do these characters sound like? What's the sense of humor? Blah, blah, blah. That's all first season is a lot of like growing pains. And we would get into these discussions about the humor. And one of the execs, because she, he, she, we'll, we'll keep it gender neutral, didn't like a, a line or didn't like a, a certain piece of dialogue, said in the room, uh, I don't think a beaver would say that. <laughs> <laughs> to, which, to which I respond, smart ass that I am, uh, beavers don't talk. And, but it's like that's such perfect you know executive logic i don't think a beaver would say that All right We're, do you remember one richard no we already hit it we hit it with hush up when it when when it was originally shut up and that was norbert's yeah. line norbert said shut up and we we had to change it to hush up um things that never made it in obviously was the final the but final episode that we recorded by my beavers which was never meant to be released by the way we should say that now it got out there um but, but um uh, remember though the one episode we did with tail slapping oh yeah no and yeah. and the and dad's army buddy slap johnson came around yeah <laughs> that was that and, and, was... and, and, and bag it was addicted to you know beavers and we would do this too is we would like take obscure facts about actual beavers like their teeth. And and beavers will slap their tail on water, which creates this noise like a gunshot to warn yeah. other beavers when there's like a predator around. And so we we did the boy who cried wolf story with Daggett getting into slapping his tail and like that <laughs> alarms everybody. And so he becomes addicted to tail slapping. Yes, he becomes addicted to tail slapping. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, and I liked, I did like, um, beaver fever the episode beaver beaver fever with the song because 
you know, that's actually based on a true fact that I didn't even know that if beavers don't chew, their, their teeth can grow through their brains. So they Holy have shit. to chew. They have to chew. And yeah. that's why Daggett is not chewing. And then Norbert's like, Doug, you have to chew until Daggett's <laughs> looking pretty cool. So then Norbert decides he's not going to chew either. And next thing you know, we're walking down the street like pimp daddies, right? Beaver, that's right. beaver, 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 beaver. Good gotcha. How? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You guys were making us laugh and making us learn. You guys were ahead of you, you guys were right. You're ahead of your time. This is bullshit. But you know, but you know, it wouldn't have been possible if Mitch did not allow us to to just go where we wanted to go. Cause all that stuff where I'm going, yeah, get it, get down, y'all. That was all just me off on the side of the mic while while Nick is singing, you know? But and those also- are the also, Nick coming in with that great line from the What's Love Got to Do With It? Put some stink on it, Daggy. Put some stink on it, Daggy. <laughs> yeah. Those moments. You know, Put I really st- attribute, like, the success of that show to to the freedom that we all had to play, which is just made mm-hmm. the show so much fun. Absolutely. Yep, yep. Uh, so you you had you'd already brought this one up, uh, Richard, but somebody did write in and wanted to know what your uh, response to the baby announcement skit that played out in the show was. But we answered that one. Uh, I didn't want them to think we skipped over that one. Was yeah. there a particular reason that it had a strong 70s style influence? Oh, where, I don't know where Mitch is on your screen, but I'm... Well, well that's... Right, Mitch is right, right there here. for me. He's right there. <laughs> I'm gonna Because Mitch has this love of pop culture yes that would often make keith cringe but <laughs> but, it, but well because you know I, I can't i can't let go of trying to pretend because i worked for mtv that i'm somehow cool but <laughs> remote control with one adam sandler mind you yeah, and dennis leary and dennis leary and colin quinn and but anyway uh but Mitch had a Mitch just loves that stuff, and he just mm-hmm. he loves the pop culture, the horror films. He loves the the sixties kitsch, the seventies yeah. kitsch, the yeah. disco stuff, um, all, all of that. And it is wonderful it, it, if you let go, if you can get past your ego, which I obviously can't. Um, <laughs> it, it's 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 wonderfully funny. It's 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 just, it's fun. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It, the stuff is just fun, and it was. In a way, it's like that allowed, uh, you know, uh, allows the the Barry Bear that whole sort of thing that we went off into the Barry the White. The Barry White, the Barry White, yeah. Well, who, who, did, who did the voice? I'm trying John to remember. John Gary, John Gary. He was just he that old baby, and that yeah. the, the episode where he was recording that song is trying to find his groove, and yeah. and he goes to his house, and it's just like that. And again, um, you're coming back to um, to Cliff's style. Of, Everything was curved like a lava lamp in his in his you know seventies pad and and oh we got to do that joke don't let the daishiki fool you yes the daishiki <laughs> you know I think that's also what bonded me to Mitch is all is that we both have a love of kitsch and the seventies and the sixties because that's kind of our era and I'm yeah. thinking back now I'm wondering if it's if it was more relevant then or if it still plays now but the certain like the, the the certain references that mitch and i would give to each other like like ranger dag says we'd say oh a barney fife ranger dag says so i was doing yeah. barney fife you know or the, the shakiest yeah. gun in the west and i don't know if it was because it was 30 years ago and that reference was still relevant but i still think today i would use the same references if we were was starting fun. it today and of course, we pulled in the listen up. Listen, listen up. But, yes. But it's, yeah. it's that sense of characters. Um, I, I think like Martin Short said, morons with power. Or, pe- yes. or people that have, you know, people that are, are well out of their depth, but don't think they are. I mean, I just love, yeah, the Andy Griffith stuff of, give me you the bullet, Andy. The fact that yes. he was the sheriff's deputy, but the sheriff would not allow him to actually have bullets in his gun. Yeah. <laughs> he, would get, he would get, you know, when Barney Fife would get like really like. Yes. Like I love when he would like, try to do the, the preamble. Give me, yeah. Give me the bullet, Andy. Give me the bullet. <laughs> we we the gonna, people. 
we the, gonna, yeah. the the people. We the people. Yeah. <laughs> Remember that episode? Love that episode. And you that know, you're, you're, talking about the, you're talking about the retro sound. Uh, Charlie Brissett was our composer. <clears throat> and he was a wonderful guy to work with. He was always up for trying anything we wanted to do. And again, he had a limited budget and a limited amount of time to do these things. Uh, but he would, he and I would sit down and we would go through each episode and talk about the kind of music cues the scenes deserved or something that I might want to do. And he told me after we finished the show, he goes, "My, I bought 250 CDs <laughs> during the making of this show. Because we get to a point like, well, this should be Andy Williams. Can't get used to losing you. What's that? Andy Williams. And uh, I, I'll have to write that down and get that. Uh, <laughs> all these obscure music choices. Don't that forget I was... Edie, Edie Gourmet. Yes. Yes. But also also to mention, <laughs> Mitch is a very good keyboard player. And so he would come in and often have like, kind of like the scratch track, the thing in his head. And uh, I, I think, well, this is this is way off the topic, but remember when we were doing uh, Bummer of Love? I think I think I like you. I think and, I like you. And you came up with the chord sequence of that, and then I think I brought <laughs> I brought a guitar in, and that that sparked that sparked a uh, a spending spree on Mike Gerard's part, where like within two months he had bought like twelve guitars because he had played yeah. guitar once before, and. And so we're to, we're to blame for that. Yeah. In a way, but yeah. no. But we we wrote that. And what was the one that we uh, that you took the chord progression from uh, the Godzilla theme? Oh man. Um. Bum, 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 bum. It was like a circle of fifth uh, or something like that. That. Well, we did we did the uh, <clears throat> the I think I like you, which was kind of a, a Cal Sills thing, but right. then. Uh, uh, we also did uh, the Rat Pack song. Yes. Uh, yeah. Hey, buddy, with your Abdullah Oblongata. <laughs> he was so uh, good. All right. And you and uh, we worked on that. There was a, there were a couple other, but well, I was really proud of. I think I like you because you're not supposed to be able to rhyme the word orange. There's not supposed to be a word that rhymes with orange. Yeah. And I came up with orange door hinge. <laughs> and I was I was so proud of that. Just I'll, just, just I'll just throw that out there. That's uh, that's how not cool I am. Um, but anyway, but you know, I, I'm trying to remember what did we do the Godzilla theme for? Because it had that really was like boom, 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 boom. And I don't know, if, I don't know. But we we threw a few songs in in there that we wrote, and we wrote lyrics like the ballad of Kid Friendly. Oh yes? yeah. Yeah. Open open wide for zombies. Yeah. Or we do, we do chase music. And then the when and the same thing, the beach movie, where uh, Vic wrote that song and went down to the beach looking for some fun. And uh met the prettiest girl under the sun. And that <laughs> Yeah, because Norbert always talks sang. Nick never <laughs> sang, he always talks sang. He like yeah. Rex Harris saying, I think I like you. You know? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Under the sun. Dad. Was, then there was the wonderful thing we did the the takeoff on the Gilbert and Sullivan the uh, the uh, lumberjack. Yeah. Oh yeah, that was good. Lumberjacks yeah. was good. Good episode. Lumberjack talk. And his legendary fur hat, Dicky. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know where that came from, but that that uh, Daggett curled up on top of uh, Norbert's head, who is Bo yeah. Beaucoup Rougeau, the famous uh, French. Uh, yes. Lumberjack, and then and his legendary fur hat, Dicky, and but I mean, it's just it was silly, right? I mean, it's not. But it, just right. no, it's, it was always silly. There's yeah. no doubt about that. We, a, we just we just had a yeah timber, timber, timber the the uh, the little crescendo in there, but it was uh, it was fun. And I think overall that was the thing. It's just like I said, it was so. Um, I felt so. I still feel so spoiled by that show. That just coming in every day and having fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I could sing songs to Mitch, like "You Fill Up My Senses," like a night with a florist. 
Come fill me again. <laughs> Good night with the come, fill, come fill me again. <laughs> All of a sudden, I, I, I want to hear Run Joey Run. Run Joey <laughs> Run. Daddy, please don't. It wasn't his fault. He <laughs> means so much to me. Daddy, please don't. We're going to get married. Just you wait and da 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 da. See, you name the 70s yeah. song, Mitch, and I know it. Run yeah. Joey Run. Oh. All right. Uh, what else you so this doing? next this this next one's not a question. It's uh, well, first one isn't. Uh, Mike Kubat. I'm pretty sure you've uh, ran into him a couple times, Mitch. But uh, Mitch is a great guy and amazingly talented. You will have fun with this one. Cheers. <laughs> so Mike wanted to write it in and say he liked working with you. Um, Isaiah Fillmore wanted to know: uh, Were there any unused concepts? you wanted to include in the 13 ghost of Scooby-Doo. I know that's not a angry beavers question, but we did just mention the Scooby-Doo chase scene just a second ago. And second time, it's been a topical timing question. <laughs> wow. Scooby-Doo 13 ghosts of Scooby-Doo. I, I, um, <clears throat> well, I worked with Tom Ruger on that. So I, I think it was because it was my first show producing that, uh, I was just going to take the lead of the writers yeah, Tom was the story editor, and, and we understood that we liked the same kind of horror movies. Uh, and uh, Laurel and Hardy liked Richard, Laurel and Hardy, and Evan Costello. So uh, I just kind of followed the writers' leads and tried to make the shows as good as you know, make them look as good as they could. So uh, that's what I remember about Scooby Doo. Got you. Uh, CJ wanted to know, was anyone on the crew of Angry Beavers surprised to see the funny messages sometimes left between their names during the credits? Richard? Keith? So, I, I think that, <coughs> that Mitch started doing the funny names between things, and I was always like, hey, how come I don't have a funny name between my thing? How come I, and he said, it's a union thing. We can't put that in the credits. You remember that, Mitch? We can't give yeah. you guys funny names because... Because you were after Because right? we were, yeah, SAG after, yeah. Or I guess back then it was just after, or maybe it was SAG. I think it was SAG back then. And uh, I was like, oh, oh, I want a funny name. What What was What was the thing about? What was the thing about them not? I don't understand that. Why couldn't you have because, a funny name? Because you, because it goes into your like your pension and health, and so it has to be your name as as it appears in the Screen Actors Guild role in the roster. So if you put like, gotcha. if, if the credit came up as, you know, Richard, you know, Richard, funny guy, Horvitz, that wouldn't match their records. So they couldn't keep track of Richard, funny guy, Horvitz. But also it's, I mean, gotcha. it's a, credits are also a union issue in mm -hmm. also like if, if a show is Writers Guild or if a show is Directors <laughs> Guild, if a show is SAG-AFTRA, there are rules about how the credits go in and yeah. how they have to be done based yeah. on the negotiations. But I always wanted one. I wanted one badly. <laughs> I guess you got one for him, Mitch. If you could have give Richard one, we'll give him one now. Let's give him a funny nickname. What would you give Richard's funny name? Richard Bulbous Prostate Corbis. That's true. At this point, that wouldn't have applied last, you know, 30 <laughs> years ago. Now it really applies. Yes. Topical nickname. Richard, now, is, uh, Richard, I know this. Richard, uh, my prostate fell out, Horvitz. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's I know this isn't. Uh, <laughs> go, ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. 30 no. years ago, we weren't talking about our prostates. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Richard, my prostate's under the car. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, hey, that's my prostate, Horvitz. <laughs> Yeah, Richard, is that, is that your prostate? Or are you just happy to see? <laughs> see, I was seeing Keith is thinking exactly where I'm going. And you know, when I think of Keith, yeah. he walks up to me in the recording booth. He's got his <laughs> in his pocket. Do you know the rest of it, Keith? Trying to remember. And you're jangling the change in your pocket. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes, yeah. I worked with. I worked with the. Uh, Valerie Bromfeld on the the Carson <laughs> show. She was Dan Aykroyd's original partner in Second City, right. and she had this character that she would do. She'd just come into the writers room where she played like a a guy. I forget the character's name, but he was like he. She'd look at all the women writers and they'd talk to her and they'd go anyway. But he she had this great joke, which is, you know, change jingling in a man's pocket. <laughs> <laughs> 
like a dog whistle to the ladies. <laughs> <laughs> so I stole that. I I I I give credit where it's due, but it's like a dog whistle to the lady. Yeah. When you know, Mitch was mentioning when I got stuck on my Bob Hope run, because I I couldn't get Bob Hope out of my head for like how many episodes was that, Mitch? That had to have been like at least five episodes. Yeah. Where everything like in the middle of like a take of like, hey, how about sheep, huh? Ain't they something? <laughs> Hey, how about pencil erasers, huh? Ain't they so but it was that it was that se- it was that seventies Bob Hope that was like it was the seventies. Well past his prime because they're like, how about that Angelian? Hey, the- that's what Keith used to go, Angelian, folks. And then Brooke Shields. Oh, yeah, that, 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 that. Brooke Shields. Hey, how about that Brooke Shields? <laughs> Ain't she something? <laughs> <laughs> Then it got so out of control in the booth. It was like, hey, how about pencil erasers? Huh? Ain't they something? <laughs> how they do that? Huh? I was like, it would be like, Mitch would never, ever go. Okay, enough. He would just play along until Mike Gerard would go. Is he ever going to do Daggett again? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, what's so great about it? I mean, it organically. Sorry, I'm pontificating, but <laughs> but it was that Daggett's character was so unhinged. Yes, that you accepted just this word salad. You know, this almost <laughs> almost a psychotic babble coming out of his mouth because he wasn't that far from a se- serial killer. <laughs> That's right. And so that so that he would go off on the screen, you go like, oh, that, "That's dead. He is not. He is. He is not a." That's not a full load of bricks. Every every now and then, Mitch would say, "All right, Richard, come back, <laughs> yeah. come back." But 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 that was the that's the beauty of that that character was he was, he was so uh, you know he was just such a, a crazy character that is the farther he was that, crazy the farther, the farther that, he that went would push it it was just like. There, you know, it no, his insanity knows no bounds, and that. But that 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 is exactly the insanity that I would bring to Mitch's porch every every week, where we would sit there, and we, we yeah. would laugh like we were getting in trouble in school. That yeah. is how we would get. We would laugh. Oh. Yeah. yeah. The one thing that I liked about Richard is uh, you write a script where uh, Norbert's saying like. Uh, Oh, being poor being, he's lost his house. He doesn't have to, anywhere to live, and he's so upset. And Richard just so. Yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> what it yeah, complete, it, <laughs> again, again, the psycho killer, complete yeah. lack of empathy. I know exactly the exact story that he's talking about because when people ask me like, "What's my favorite show?" I said, "You know, it's hard to choose my favorite show because so much of me goes into him, but." The one that is the most like me is Daggett. And it's because of one scene, it was at my bunny guard. So we're being, we're like these notes, these threatening notes keep um, showing up on our door. And the one thing that I loved about my character is whenever someone would come into the studio with a voice, like the big bunny, Daggett would always start talking <laughs> like that character. So big bunny, so like, What'd you do it for, Bunny? What'd you do it for, right? And so, right. and Norbert would say, says, you know, you didn't have to do all this. You could have just asked me, asked us, and we would have been your friend. And and the big bunny goes, oh, you're just saying that so I don't feel bad. And Daddy goes, yeah, so? <laughs> that is me in a nutshell. Yeah, yeah. so? <laughs> I loved it. That was yeah. one of my those are my favorite moments of that show, is that uh, is that I is that that Mitch let me do the voices of the other actors coming on the show. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly, Daggett has a New York accent, <laughs> unexplained. We never explained anything. No. Oh God, I love that boy. Now, missing this, I think I want to respoot. Let's do Angry Beavers respooted right now. Keith, get on the keyboard. All right. <laughs> yeah. Crack back, crack yeah, back yeah. into those substances you were yes, uh, you yes. were in, introduced yeah. to by these these oh. this, this show. All right, yeah. so 
I've kept you long enough. There's a lot more questions, ladies and gentlemen, but there was a lot of ground covered here. A lot of these questions were answered throughout this entire almost two hours worth of chatting. Yeah. Um, before before we do a little sign off, though, I would like to go one by one just so we can uh, put it out there. Keith, we'll start with you since you're the top left to me. What are you working on now that we can push some traffic towards? What can people be excited to see? Uh, well, as a... <laughs> I'm working on a, a project um, with a couple of animators that I met on the Angry Beavers, and it's for the uh, with in association with the Showa Foundation, which was started by Steven Spielberg after Schindler's List, and this is uh, probably the anti Angry Beavers. <laughs> say, uh, uh, was, we're working on a series of uh, short animation for children to educate them about the Armenian genocide. Mm -hmm. Absolutely no laughs, but it's it's yeah. been it's, it's been a really gratifying process. Uh, the people working on it, and uh, we, hope, we hope to get that out there uh, sometime this spring to have uh, to have that up there, and it would be on the uh, website for Showa at USC. So that's uh, that's one project, and uh, the rest of it is just trying to uh, trying to figure out what I'm going to be when I grow up. You know. Don't ever grow up, Keith. I don't ever grow up. Say, there's your problem. Don't grow up, Keith. Yeah. <laughs> I remember <laughs> asking. I remember asking Ken Ober, the guy who started in the remote control. Uh, somebody came up to him. He's a guy from Boston, and when the Boston Red Sox finally won the World Series after the curse of the Bambino for many, many years, they said to him, "Ken, now that the Red Sox have won the World Series, what are you going to do?" And Ken said to him, "I'm going to work on me." <laughs> so that's that's my that's my next project working, on, working me. on me pretty good all right richard what about you richard what uh what can we push the fans towards uh i'm gonna try to get on board with helping keith work on him so i'm gonna submit my resume to keith <laughs> um so currently i'm um i'm starring in and voice directing a show called hell of a boss on um on YouTube right now, it's a pretty big show. And then I'm also voice directing um, for that same Helliverse, a show called Has Been Hotel, which is on Amazon Prime that I'm also voice directing. I'm not on that one, but I'm voice directing that. Plus, I'm still working for Nickelodeon. I'm, I'm, work, I'm on Loud House right now. I, I do a character mm -hmm. called Morpheus. And so um, they've been good to me over the years. And uh, other than that, video game stuff, I got, a, I got Star Wars, uh, um jedi survivor that's out where i play turgle so a bunch of stuff like that but that's what i'm doing i'm sticking to it and now i'm going to work on keith we're going to work on keith if, keith we're if you need a recommendation keith. if you need a recommendation I've, i know this guy named richard horvitz he's yeah. he's really good i can i can vouch yeah. for him yeah i can it's, work on is, keith. is richard becoming a life coach now yes yeah, it's I'm possible. Gonna help you. i'm gonna help you because you hurt your back I, I just remember we we had an artist who how'd remade. you hurt your yeah how'd you hurt your back Keith fuck it this was this was an actual thing that one of our recording sessions I came in complaining as if I'd actually hurt my back. So, so I could get Richard to say, "Well, how'd you how'd hurt you hurt your back?" So, so yeah, that. And <laughs> there was that. There was but, that. Mitch, follow that one. Yeah, Mitch. My back's fine. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's sorry. It's too bad. Uh, I have a uh, a movie I directed. Uh, it's currently airing on Netflix called the Soccer Football Movie. It's a CG animated movie. That I did, that I spent several years on, and uh, before that, I, you know, I after I finished Beavers, I went to Berlin for a couple of years, and then I worked at Marvel for almost ten years, Superhero Squad, and Hulk and the Agents of Smash, and movies and things. So uh, right now, I'm just I'm developing two shows for these two writers to pitch to Netflix because I've worked at Netflix. So um, we're gonna we're gonna try to see if we can get two adult animated shows going so can i have a question mitch the work in yeah. berlin uh, on which side <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I 
can't say. Uh, he only wants to know as a commie, right? But there was a big, there, but there was a big wall. I remember a big wall. Yeah, yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah, and, a che and checkpoint Charlie. <laughs> yeah, I knew Thank him. You. Thank you, Elvis. <laughs> Well, this is the this is the part of the show that I really get to enjoy because I get to get a little sappy for a second. I'm gonna go one by one. Keith, thank you for writing some of my favorite scripts of all time with an angry beavers. You really made it fun to sit there. And up until this one, I didn't know that the facts you guys were given about beavers were actually real facts. So not only did I get to <laughs> laugh at what you wrote, I also got to learn at what you what you wrote. Um, Richard, thank you for being a voice that I absolutely look forward to every show I ever saw your name in. You guys gave me so much joy with Angry Beavers. You guys gave me so much joy with an Invader Sim. So thank you for that. Thank you. Mitch, if it wasn't for you and this beautiful show, man, I would have not thought that animals fought just like me and my brother. Everybody says that I was a norb. I was a dag, right? I don't know which one I was. I was the angry one. I can tell you which one I was. Um, but I I looked at that and I looked at my brother and we bonded over certain shows. There was a ceasefire. My brother and I, we declared Switzerland. We were free of war. My mom got a reprieve for 30 minutes for a couple shows. One of them, the first one being SWATcast, that was the first show we ever bonded over and watched, me and my younger brother. And Angry Beavers, because it was like, oh shit, we see ourselves in these characters. So thank you for giving my mom just a little bit of respite, not want to hang herself every time her two sons were fighting. So I appreciate that, Mitch. I'm happy to help and thank you. Thanks to all of you. Thank you, Absolutely. Mitch. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Julian. Oh, thank you, guys. No, thank you, guys. Yeah, no, yes. thank No, no, thank you. No, 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 thank, uh -oh. you. Thank, you. thank you. No, thank, no thank, you. thank you. No, thank you. I'm going to work on you. <laughs> work on you. <laughs> We're going to all work on Keith, so send We're us some inspirational shit, Keith. ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> it's, it's our profound hope that after after Richard works on me, <laughs> nothing's wrong with my back. Oh, wow. <laughs> hey, hold on. <laughs> hold oh. on. Oh. Oh. Good, I, good. I quit. Good. I quit. <laughs> I'm just happy that I gave Mitch a mental picture he can't erase. Well, I can't. He'll draw it. He'll draw it. He's gonna draw it. Yeah, he's gonna draw it. Draw it. You're gonna get a. You're gonna oh, get a post-it no. note. Oh that no! no it's, we're gonna soon. go to the file. <laughs> and it's just gonna... gonna say, "I think I like you." <laughs> we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna be in the file. Oh my god! Yes, we're gonna be you in like the file. Time. See what I? I just time. proved my own point, Julian. I proved my own point. <clears throat> you don't know, wise off or pontificate around animators because there's gonna be a picture. Oh, there's going to be multiple pictures. I can tell you, the Keith Spider is coming. <laughs> it's not the only thing coming. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you didn't, Julian. Oh, 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 Julian. <laughs> On that note. <laughs> He's been Keith. He's been Richard. He's been Mitch. This has been What's in My Head podcast. And this has been another piece and a very huge piece of your childhood. Good night.